Our final speaker is John Warnock. Hi again. Uh, when I got to uh, Xerox Park, uh, the world changed. I was surrounded by a ton of really, really, really smart people. Uh, and they were sort of concentrated on a whole variety of topics, a whole variety of what things were. And you, you inherited an Alto computer and you inherited uh, laser printers. Okay, and as the time went by, you got color laser printers. And as time went by, you got essentially typesetter quality printers. Uh, so in my head, I thought the right thing to do, since the world communicates with documents, is design a program that will actually print any document that you can think of in any typeface that you can think of, in any orientation that you can think of, in any resolution you can think of. And uh, that would really bring all of science and publishing, all of publishing, books, newspapers, magazines, uh, into the world, into a digital world. Uh, I had a bunch of help with that, Martin Newell. Uh, I used to drink beers a lot at La Hacienda with uh, last speaker. <laughs> uh, so we had lots and lots of conversations of how to do this. And I felt that the only way you could, and, and the suggestions of all the people who wanted to do this, is how do you just put the bits on the page? And so they had developed lots of fonts at Xerox, but the way they had to develop a font was they had to, for every resolution, they had to design a bitmap and tune it so that the font looked really good. So it didn't look like a piece of crap. Uh, so the font problem was a really hard problem. So when you use the Alta computer at Xerox, you had a different bitmap, a little thing of all the fonts for every size and every font. And I thought, well, you know, that's not the way to do this. The way to do this is to figure out how to deform the letter shapes so that if you have a target resolution, the de deformation of the letter shape will correct for the bits that are gonna be picked out of it. And so you'll have uniform staffs on a lowercase m all, everything will be corrected by a program. So that all you need is the outline of the font and you can make the font any size you want. And it will be automatically scan converted to any display. And display, the displays at that time could either be grayscale displays that had grayscale capability or they could be high resolution typesetters that had very, very high resolution. Uh, worked on that problem and the people at Xerox taught me about Bezier curves. And Bezier curves are the best curves in the world. You, with Bezier curves, you can make any shape you want. Uh, currently at Adobe, we offer 10,000 fonts, families, in all languages. I think in 23 or 24 languages, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, I, everything. Uh, so the this font problem getting solved and the representation of what a page is 
in color and in black and white that is in such a way that it is device independent. It can be displayed on a screen, it can dis be displayed on a color printer, it can be displayed on a grayscale printer, it can be displayed for newspapers, for magazines, for any publication that you can imagine. The goal was to have a representation that did that. Okay, so came up with JAM, which was done by Martin Newell and myself, and some other help from other people. Uh, and that actually worked. So we did build good characters. We did build them in all different kinds of fonts. Uh, showed this to Xerox, and they said, well, that's interesting, but we're not gonna do that until you show us that it'll work on every product that Xerox had. And I said, no, thank you. So we left and we started Adobe Systems and took a number of the very, very smartest people out of Xerox Park to Adobe Systems and we started to build uh, PostScript printers. Uh, one of the first people we dealt and Steve Jobs from Apple had snuck in to Xerox Park, seen the Alto, and that des he decided, well, we have to build the Macintosh. Or first it was the Lisa, but the, then the Macintosh. Uh, Xerox, it was the worst, worst decision for Xerox to let Steve Jobs come in and see <laughs> what was going on. So he said, well, I have to build the Lisa, I have to build the Macintosh. So when we started Adobe, uh, we called Steve and uh, showed him what our page description language would look like. And he said, okay, I'll uh, invest $5 million for 20% of your company. And uh, he did that. And he said, we're gonna bring out to Lisa and the Macintosh with that code embedded in the laser printer. So we, we had PostScript and we embedded in the laser printer. And so we built a huge catalog of every conceivable page that could be in a magazine or in any document. And that all worked and I had this great sample book and uh, we started well, when the Macintosh came out and the laser writer came out, Steve said, we'll put PostScript into the laser writer. So I had these great fancy pages that I had constructed that showed any conceivable combination that you might see in a magazine. And he thought that was great. So he was gonna announce the laser writer and he was gonna announce this and he went to uh, he said, give me your samples, because so, he didn't have any software yet that would do that. So he, I gave him all my samples, and he had this one very, very complex page that he wanted to print in the announcement of the laser writer. And he went away, and then he called me on the phone, and he said, John, guess what? That sample takes three and a half minutes to print. And uh, he said, if you think I'm going on to a conference stage and wait three and a half minutes <laughs> for the page to come out of the printer, you're crazy. He said, fix it. <laughs> and, and so I thought about that and I thought about it for about a day and a half, and I said, well, one of the interesting properties of PostScript is that every single operator can be redefined. It, PostScript has a dictionary, and if you have an add operator, you can make the add op operator do something else. So I looked at the way that PostScript generated images, and I said, well, you know, if I 
change all of the operators, or, or if I go through the postscript file and every time it prints something, if I change the nature of the operator so that it doesn't sort of print it, but sort of sets out a different file format that just contains the printing part of it, that might work. And so I sat down one day and I wrote some code to do that. And uh, it took me about one day to do this. Uh, and then I took his sample and I ran it through and it didn't print in three and a half minutes, it printed in 13 seconds. So that was the foundation of PDF files. So if you have PDF files, what they are is the distilled version of the PostScript file that only has the printing commands. Well, that sort of worked. Uh, <laughs> when, we when we introduced PDF, it became everyone who wanted to communicate documents over the internet everyone who wanted to store documents, everyone who wanted to put documents away, they had this document that would print on a typesetting machine, that would print on a black and white machine, that would print on a grayscale machine, that would print on anything and on any screen. Well, the government had already standardized on PostScript and it took them about four microseconds to standardize on PDF. And over the years, the number of files that have been created is in the trillions. And the number that are on the net are in the trillions. And they're growing sort of every day. Uh, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings our graphic symposium to a close. I think it's been mar marvelous. Let's give all the speakers another hand. And that terminates the whole, the whole celebration, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>